Welcome to Kidney Talk, a program of Renal Support Network, a show that streams health, happiness, and hope to the kidney community. You can download all Kidney Talk shows from iTunes and find a variety of resources to help you navigate this illness at rsnhope.org. Please welcome your host, Lori Hartwell, who has lived with kidney disease since the age of two. Well, welcome to Kidney Talk, everyone. I am so thrilled today because I have uh, somebody that I admire so much in the kidney community, and he is just a shining example of how to live well with kidney disease. So uh, we're going to talk to uh, Bill Peckham. Welcome to the show, Bill. Hi, Lori. So you have just this amazing story of living with kidney disease. And would you give like a little bit of, you know, when you were diagnosed um, and, you know, how you you chose which treatment and and a little 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 snapshot of your your life because it's so magnificent of what you've done. <laughs> I'll run through uh, that. I was uh, first had symptoms in 1985, right after college. I was 22 years old. Uh, I got good medical care, but the function declined. I you know could see it happening, and uh, so in 1988, I had a preemptive transplant. So again, really good care. It was my brother, my oldest brother, and um, we just scheduled it. Like, mm-hmm. how's July look? <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and so I had it, and uh, but unfortunately, um, it was pretty clear, pretty much right away, that it um, was having the original problem that my native kidney ha- kidneys have. And uh, at the time, uh, it's over time now. We we call it today FSGS. Uh, this was back in the 80s and then the early 90s, and they've had different names. But long and the short of it is the um, way my blood interacts with uh, any kidney uh, can cause the kidney to kind of clog up and stop working as a filter. That's how I understand it anyways. And, uh, and so in just two years from the transplant, I needed to start dialysis. So you can see, again, just the trend where it was going. And I had the fistula placed in May and then started dialysis in September of 1990. So, again, that's that's good care. Right. You got the fistula. That's the big deal. That's the big uh, success right there. <laughs> yeah, I didn't appreciate it at the time. But um, looking back, I, I realized that all along I had, you know. And so I started dialysis at the Northwest Kidney Centers, very angry, very depressed. I said I was in a hoping the rain it would rain mood because then I wouldn't feel bad about not wanting to go outside and do anything. <laughs> but almost right away they they said, well, you can travel, you can go places. So I, I took my first trip back to Chicago, and uh, it was just <laughs> it was like, oh, this is weird having strangers doing all this, and uh, it led to me learning to put in my needles within about a month of getting back. A, a staff person, April, really. That she she said she knew I could do it way before I knew I could do it or thought I could do it, but once I started putting in my needles, that really that really helped and uh, made it much easier. Um, you know, once once our needles are in, we're all kind of the same. And, and there, yeah, when you travel, you have different people. Yeah, you know, it's scary. Yeah, and so and it's a signal too when you go to a unit. You know, you're visiting; they don't know you any more than you know them. I mean, they have your medical record, but. You know, if they see you wash your hands when you come in, wash your fistula, that you, um, you know, get yourself situated and put in your own needles, you know, they're going to have an idea of, uh, oh, okay, so they'll listen when you suggest what you think your dry weight should be or your target fluid removal should be and things like that. So it, it really smooths away a lot, I think. And, and that, and I think I felt that way, uh, through my in-center, I dialyzed in-center for 11 years. I started uh, working through the Carpenters Union in 1995, and uh, I'd been taking trips uh, around the U.S. to my mom uh, would invite me to go play golf somewhere. And so I set up dialysis and meet there and um, did a, you know quite a few trips. Uh, but then with insurance through the union, I could get reimbursed for dialysis abroad. Oh, wow. I, I imagined it was like some kind of oversight. Because they didn't think <laughs> of I'm sure they dialysis. closed that loophole, right? <laughs> as soon as I found out about it, I planned a two-month trip, the whole Rick Steves deal. You know, seven seven units in four countries. Back when there were all different currencies in Europe. And uh, super fun. And uh, I just loved it. Oh, gosh, I loved it so much. At the end, all I needed to do was wash some clothes, and I could have gone for another two, minutes, two months. 
But I came home with these receipts, you know, some were handwritten, others were typed out and looked official. But in different currencies, different units, all different formats. Turned them in on, I think, a Thursday and the next Wednesday I had a check for 100% of the cost. Of whatever you pay. So so what is the most um, exotic place you travel to abroad? (laughs) I've been to a lot of places uh, and they're all, I really just enjoy travel. But I mean... Africa, it's got to be safari in Africa. It's in South Africa, you know, and in the open Jeep photo safari, you know, a photo safari, of course. Mm-hmm. And uh, in in the Kruger Game Reserve, which uh, is like a, like a huge national park, and right adjacent to it is a is a really kind of world class, famous resort called Sabi Sabi. And so it was like a trip of a lifetime with my mom. I met my mom in Cape Town and. I mean, it's just a, it's just a great memory I have. Um, I, I I always have. I have a photo album. You know, I have all these photos these days. But on that trip, I actually I put together an album afterwards. Like, and uh, I like looking at that. It was <laughs> just all the animals and just remembering that. Wow, that really happened. And you just dialized in center. You just went in center, made an appointment, and they yeah, gave this you a was bill. Nineteen ninety nine. And, uh, and so 1999, the internet was kind of in the early stages, but there's this, um, doctor, I guess, I, I can't remember, I know his last name was Pope, uh, in South Africa, and he, um, ran or owned a chain of private units because of, you know, South Africa's apartheid history. It, it still to this day has kind of two tiers where a very busy public health system and then a, 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 a private system on top of that. So this was a private diocese unit of so just one, two, or three stations. And oh, wow. uh, I just connected them together. And so the, there was a Cape Town unit. That's where I started. And then uh, there's a Port Elizabeth unit. And so to get there, we drove from Cape Town. My mom and I drove from Cape Town to uh, Port Elizabeth. It was such an adventure. You know, I'm you're on the wrong side of the road. Really? It was a shift car. You know, that you're driving on the road. You know, it's just like the drivers are crazy, and I'm taking this larium for, to prevent malaria. That stuff, like, messes with your head. It's like, <laughs> oh, it was just funny. It was just so many funny, you know, great times. And uh, and then from there, we flew to uh, another unit. Uh, I'm going to mispronounce the town, but it's, it's spelled Nels Pruitt. And that was about a two-hour drive from the Sabi Sabi. So I, I could dialyze there and then take my weekend and have two nights up at the game resort. That's really exciting. I mean, as yeah. far as I know, that trip is still available. And, and those units are actually, that's the least I've ever spent for dialysis. So it was about $180 uh, treatment. Where's the most expensive place you've traveled to for treatment? Uh, I got sandbagged in Marseille. And they charged me $1,100 in 1997. And I had been talking to them and, and there was like a outpatient unit in town and then they steered me to the hospital unit and they're like, Oh, it's just a normal price, normal price. Cause I'm asking ahead of time and I get there and then it's $1,100. Like, <laughs> wow. I was so mad. It was like, you know, 7,700 francs or whatever it was, the change rate. And, uh, I was just so mad. I was like, but I'm stuck. I mean, I was really thinking about, well, could I go back to Barcelona? Could I go ahead? I was just, so I felt just ripped off. <laughs> yeah, and, high uh, blood pressure that day, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, it wasn't even that good of a unit, and they were snotty. It was just kind of like the snotty French stereotype. <laughs> it was just like, uh, so aggravated. Did you get a meal? Did you get a meal with the dialysis at least? I don't even remember. Yeah, probably <laughs> they always give you food. But. So the funny part, though, or the, the karma part is that night I'm, I'm traveling with my buddy Ray, from college, and we go to, uh, or the next night, I don't think we spent the night in, in Marseille, we went to Nice, and then uh, we went to Monte Carlo, we, we had our appointment, or our, our hotel in, uh, in Nice, and we go to Monte Carlo, just a train ride away, and uh, I couldn't lose, I was playing roulette, which is a silly game, because it's all, and I was just playing two numbers, and they have this, this little tower that says what the numbers are, that the last 20 roll or spins, or whatever, and <laughs> like my number was up there six or seven times of that. I won back all the money that unit cost me, which of course I was getting reimbursed for too. I was just, but I just thought it was like, 
It's a and, sign. Uh, it was a sign. I, was, to I have have fun. a picture of me lying in, in the bed because then we had to leave. Usually the problem with uh, gambling is you just keep gambling until you lose it. But we had to get back to Nice and the last train was the last train. So <laughs> I have this stuff photo of me just covered in French franks in my bed and uh, in Nice. And it's just like, that was just a real, as down as I was after the treatment, that's how up I was after, after Christmas. The- I really believe travel is an important part of living well with kidney disease. And, and maybe it doesn't have to be travel in the way I do, of course, but it's just the idea that you get out of this rut. I mean, and that happened, I, I, I dialed at home now, so I didn't finish the story. In, in 2001, I started dialing at home. I now dialed overnight. I just dialed last night, um, you know, five five nights a week, basically. So, um, But at that time, I was in center, and, and, and for me, that travel was a way to get out of that three-day-a-week rut of dialysis and mm-hmm. you get out into this new thing and you're living life and you remember how just amazing this world can be <laughs> and just how fun it can be and just how interesting and the sights and just the smells and sounds and you just you get a, a you, like you remember why you're doing all this stuff. Right. And uh, I just really think that, um, you know, just going to the shore or whatever the, the um, kind of the weekend trip is where you live, uh, for me, like going down to Oregon, I used to, um, you know, just would drive down to Oregon on my weekend to be on the beaches. And, uh, I think that's just, you know, walking along a beach is, I mean, if it, 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 it's so easy to get in that, go to dialysis, dialysis day off, and take care of all the stuff you didn't do yesterday. <laughs> and then it, it repeats, you know, and, right. and you're just like, it just seems like it's this endless thing. And, you just have to schedule it. You just have to say, no, we're going to go here. And then that's what you're going to do. And then, uh, there's all sorts of challenges to make it happen. And, uh, but eventually you get it together and, and, uh, and you give yourself that chance to get some perspective and to, um, remember, you know, and to recenter yourself. I mean, I remember, and we have a show about, uh, you traveling down, the uh, Snake River, is that right? Colorado River. Colorado River, and you brought your next stage machine with you so you could dialyze by the shore, right? Yeah, well, yeah, exactly. After rafting during the day, we tie the rafts up to shore. and actually was dialyzing on the raft. It was tied to shore, but that's the, the most comfortable spot and least sandy spot. So uh, it was, um, yeah. And you had a generator, right? You had a generator? Yep, <laughs> two generators, <laughs> but we only needed one, and uh, yeah, that was, that's a peak life experience that um, is is almost, uh, I still haven't almost fully processed it, it was just, just uh, it, for me, it was like this idea that I could I could go on safari in Africa, but I couldn't go down the Grand Canyon, and I'd always wanted to, go. I had a chance when I was a kid, and I always wanted to, and uh yeah, but it happened because I have this transportable machine. And like this um, September, I'm chartering a boat, a 42-foot uh, CHB-style trawler, and uh, me and uh, friends are going to um, be up in the San Juan Islands, and I'll have my machine with me and just stylize at night at the dock. And, uh, you know, that, those sort of things just make you feel so normal. I, I mean, I can talk about the trips I just had or the trips I have coming up with anybody and it just feels you just a normal you're having normal conversation it's like oh yeah i saw hamilton now you're a hamilton junkie is that right alas i admit it <laughs> you're a hamilton junkie uh just everybody who's listening who knows bill he is a or a hamilton groupie however you want to phrase it and it's funny because i i couldn't um i've seen other musicals i like like young frankenstein book of mormon i can think of and then um some of the older classics right family would go to them and take me along but i've never been able to quote lyrics i've <laughs> been just excited about something and i've just i really have enjoyed it and uh, i've seen a number of the productions i know the, uh know the whole cast album pretty well and um read the books that are associated with it and uh yeah it's just been kind of fun i've just let myself get into it you know and uh and so I, uh, I, yeah, I'm going to Las Vegas in, uh, on, and I'll see it on Thursday, a week from 
<laughs> we, and we it, today. Is there other groupie Hamilton people you've connected with? Yeah, I have my Hamil buddy who I go to these <laughs> things with. <laughs> That's wonderful. And, uh, and occasionally it comes up, you know, somebody else will mention it and then you'll find out you have this in common. And a lot of people haven't heard anything about it. It's Hamilton, Alexander Hamilton, is our uh, founding father, a, a, the first treasury secretary, and, but he was also uh, was born uh, impoverished in the Caribbean in a terrible period of time of deprivation and slavery. And I mean, he just had this incredible life, and uh, and he could have probably had three musicals based on his life, but. Uh, somehow Lynn Manuel Miranda had wrote, written this based on a, you know, a, one of those three inch history books you see about a, a founding father that Glenn Shertow wrote this, you know, big fat serious history book of Hamilton and, and, uh, the person who wrote the musical picked it up for vacation <laughs> reading and he's reading a book about the first treasury secretary of the United States and he's like, this is like, these are like rappers, you know, he, he, he <laughs> caught beef with every founding father. He, he wrote, he uses the power of words to, you know, insult I, and, I, and I, provoke. I, and I have to admit, I do have the soundtrack, but I have been not, I have not been lucky enough to score tickets. So uh, that is on my bucket list. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I have I to get up I'll early in the morning. I'm going to uh, high school productions in about five years. Probably I'll still want to see it. <laughs> so, so, you know, you, you've you been on dialysis now for how many years? It'll be uh, 28 years in September, 30 years of ESRD. So my transplant was, uh, in, it would have been next month, 30 years ago next month. And, you know, you've explained, um, because I, uh, the people who are listening, I think it's really important to, you know, how do you live well with kidney disease? The medical stuff is one side, taking care of yourself, but... Uh, you've really proven that you know the your mental stability and how you perceive yourself in life is so important. Um, can you just express a little bit more about that? How you've taken care of that aspect and travel is one of them. A- any other um, sh- stories to share? Yeah, but I, I would just preface preface you know the idea that um, I had full control over how well I'm doing. I, I feel like I've kind of walked a golden path in a lot of ways. But, um, you know, there's genetics and there's luck and it, it's just like, I can't take full credit for anything. But I think one thing, um, maybe in reflecting on it is that I kind of came to the idea at different points, you know, well, let's see how far I can take this. You know, it's mm-hmm. like, rather than say, oh, this is what, this is all I could do is whatever that is, whatever. You know, I, I had all sorts of ideas. I started dialysis before the internet. So I, I thought I had three years to live and I would just slowly decline and die. <laughs> it's really what I thought. And so, uh, but you know, once I realized, oh, actually I'm starting to feel okay. <laughs> I, you know, I came to the idea that, well, let's see how far I can go. Let's see what I can do. Let's see, you know, it's like. And you worked full time too. In addition to traveling and you have animals and a support system? That came after the uh, sort of just that that attitude moment of let's see how far this can go. Let's push it. Let's see what I can do. And so let's see if I can work. You know, let's see if I can work a physical union job. I mean, when you start off in a union, uh, setting up trade shows, that's what I did. It's carpenter's union, but we set up trade shows. I mean, you're the low person on the totem pole. They don't care dialyze or not or whatever but you have to kick out that carpet you got to go grab those things for the the people with more seniority you're you're constantly doing the schlep work and i mean you know so it's like well can i what would happen if i tried to do that and and uh you know what i kind of stumbled into was this idea from changing a downward spiral of not you know sleep well not then having energy to exercise then not really eating well and it just kind of spiraling down into this upward spiral where uh, work, I'm hungry, I got to eat three meals a day, I have to, and then I I have to sleep, and, and then I, you know, the, the more I eat, the more I sleep, the harder I can work, and then that makes it, so I'm eating more, <laughs> sleeping more, and, and, you, and you know, and you know it's diet, exercise, and, 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 and dialysis, right, is really is the foundation. 
the stool that all this is built on. And so I, you know, I, I didn't do it. I didn't start saying, oh, I do need to eat better. I do need to exercise more. I do. It was more like, I'm just going to try working. And then those things followed. And I, and so in that respect, I was, I stumbled into that, that, um, that little kind of magic formula of anytime I feel really run down. So after I retired, uh, last year, I was really run down. I had had, I had ruptured, fully ruptured my quadricep in December. Uh, you know, I had my, you know, the problems, uh, my mom and I, had, you know, a lot, a lot of things going on, overwhelmed. And, uh, I was just in rough shape. My hands are, um, I had carpal tunnel surgeries on both wrists that, you know, were just partially successful. And, and so it, it's taken, <laughs> I had to re, redo it and say, okay, let's see what we can do now and, you know, get back into, but, on purpose eating better and on purpose exercising whereas before it was a consequence of working so um you know at, at different times i just i say okay this is where i am let's see how where i can get from here well i think you know you have this uh unstoppable attitude and that's what it really takes to live a full life with such a serious chronic illness uh, I know for a fact that, you know, through all of your activities and all the th- all the things that you love to do, you've created a great network of people around you, too, which comes with going out and enjoying life. I mean, I meet some people who have kidney disease and their whole life is centered around their illness, and then they wonder why they don't have a lot of friends. And you have to be <laughs> a little bit interesting other than your illness <laughs> to maintain, you know, strong friendships and, uh, you know, find interest. It's, it's hard. It, it's very hard. And it, it, it dwindles. <laughs> you, you have to invest time in friendship. You know, you want a friend, be a friend, right? And so exactly. It's hard to help someone move when you're not feeling well. Or, I don't know that. I do that. But it's hard to commit to, you know, going to the movie or doing whatever, you know, just you would do ordinarily it it's easy to let things slip and and then you know i it, it, it's just very hard and uh and so i i've had you know things drop away and and it's also my interest changed you know i mean it's not like i can talk about um the finer details of medicare reimbursement with dialysis for anybody <laughs> in my <laughs> in my circle for some reason they're just not yeah, that they're not that all that excited my thoughts on I, fluid management or something. I know I gave a speech one time at Toastmasters about Medicare, and I was just so excited about it. And you could see their eyes glazing over, and and I'm like, you guys really need to know this, you know? And they're like, no, we're not really. And so, um, so yeah, so we'll talk later, and you can tell me about all the little intricacies, and we can chat about that. But it's so important to find people that you have have uh, the same interests. And if you have kidney disease and you have the same interest, then you have a double bond. I'll tell you something. Uh, I think we could, uh, RSN should do an abstract or a poster and you could just survey uh, members, but I'm going to make a, uh, put out a theory that um, long term uh, dialyzers or people with kidney disease who have done well have dogs. That's my theory. Uh, yeah. Because we, we have to, we, we have someone else to care, you know, all the things you know, I know. as well as I do. Animals. Yeah, maybe it's animals. I really think dogs, though, because you have to walk them. And, uh, they're just, uh, you know, relentless. <laughs> a, well, well, you know, we're both dog lovers, and I have four dogs right now, right? And uh, my friend called me. She has a rescue, and she's actually, uh, I met her through a rescue group, but then I learned she donated a kidney to her brother. And so we have this extra bond, but she, you know, is desperate right now because, you know, at, at the pound, puppies get put down because they can't care for them. So she took a bunch of puppies, and so I guess three of them are coming to my house tomorrow. And I said, I'll foster, I'll foster three of your puppies. That we'll have, a, you know, a little group and get them adopted. But it's it's so wonderful. You have birds too. Right? I have a bird. I have an African gray parrot that I've had since 1990, and I did not know that. They said you're not supposed to have parrots, yada yada yada, and I didn't know that when I got the bird. And he's 27. 
And, you know, he's my child. He He's uh, really super smart, and and I love him. I get up every morning. Yeah, I mean, it's it's really, it's it's amazing how animals and, and uh, pets are such a big part of your life. But you know what I would like to do, Bill, is we have so much to say. So I would like to um, make a part two of this interview. Is that okay? And we, we talk sure. a little bit about more about some of the successes. And uh, we'll be back with Bill Peckham. So stay tuned, everyone. Thanks for listening to Kidney Talk, a program of Renal Support Network. Please make sure to find us on Facebook or sign up for our newsletter at rsnhope.org. Kidney Talk is intended for informational purposes only. It is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment from your physician. Always seek the advice of your own health care provider regarding your medical condition.